My name is Neil Snorman and um, this is the GeoCruiser. It's a project that I designed together, uh, well it was commissioned by the Institute of Visual Culture in Cambridge and I designed it um, um, in the spring of this year, not 2001. Uh, we then went into production uh, this summer and it took about three months to build with a grant from the Arts Council of Great Britain. It's um, a Volvo coach, B10 coach, that has been redesigned so that the first third is a reading room. Uh, on board we have a solar powered laptop which has a remote internet connection. We have two different seating areas which we also hold presentations in. We've been touring since September around Europe and every time we stop at a location we then have a public presentation by people, um, local people about alternative energy or about um, topics that are, um, that are um, to do with the, the library of the bus. My main concern for the GeoCruiser is the idea of a public sculpture is maintained within a public space. A lot of people read it as, as if it's an eco-bus or it's a educational schools vehicle. Neil, would you like to, to explain something about the coach? <laughs> well, this coach is a specially designed coach. And it is all of these things, but it's, those are only layers. And it it's, a, it's, for me, the main overriding concern is that it's seen as a form of public sculpture. I have done it before with a bicycle, that I, a bicycle trailer, which is, a, which is the same model. Um, it's a, a, a mobile library with a, Xerox, uh, with a Xerox machine and solar panel with almost the same books, but a smaller selection on the back of a bike. Uh, it also has a weather station. And this functioned in a very similar way to the GeoCruiser, but the GeoCruiser enables us or me to develop larger, um, a larger library, um, a greenhouse, um, the possible use of biodiesel um, wind energy. So it, it allows for, to develop the whole idea much, in a much greater way. This is the solar system. Uh, this whole first third of the bus is solar panelled, and we have a um, we have a 24 volt array on the roof, which um, the which goes into a battery bank that we have below the uh, floor here. This then comes into this converter through the controller, and then that powers our Xerox machine and the Xerox machine and the, li and the lights and the laptop. I usually try and find out who is going to be interested for, or who is um, curious enough to develop a longer conversation or a more uh, in-depth conversation. And once I've established who those people are when I'm on board, then I usually get into a larger conversation with them about public sculpture and so on. But usually, a lot of people just come in and come out um, and I don't think it would be necessary for me to sort of develop any conversation really on a, on a larger level without being too imposing on their sort of mm. private space. I haven't necessarily seen uh, an immediate effect from the bus. There are people who have become very interested in the topics, that the, the content of the bus mm. and that um, has been quite um, encouraging because their reactions have been very um, uh, extremely um, inc um, optimistic and um, very um, sort of uh, quite happy that this thing is, has suddenly arrived at their doorstep because it's, sh it's offered them certain pockets of information that they d didn't necessarily know about and were unaware of. Um, for example, how you can actually take your own diesel engine and pour in vegetable oil. That was something unknown to a lot of people and that could possibly have a sort of changing effect. I don't necessarily see myself as a kind of eco person. I just see myself as a person trying to think of alternative solutions to a system that is kind of quite um, rigid that we have to live with, within. And 
and we can't live outside of that, but maybe we could even we could think of ways of kind of somehow subvert that from the in, from this sort of inside position that we all of us are in. And now it miraculously doesn't spin. <laughs> Artists are in a very, very special position because they have a certain, they're very privileged and they have a certain amount of freedom and time. And that freedom and time and also this ability to cross boundaries. So artists can work with theoreticians, they can work with physicists, they can work with musicians, with architects. But physicists and musicians can't necessarily work with these other people. It's only from what I've from what I've experienced and what I've seen, it's only artists who can actually move between all these different people. And I think that actually gives them an incredible amount of power. And um, working on these micro levels where you, your frontier basically is your block, that for me is really an important idea because it's about basically taking politics down to a, an incredibly small scale and starting from your own back garden and then just sort of trying to, trying, to, um, trying to either push the frontiers or trying to change them slightly from this very micro um, point. This is the library area and the books in the library consist of gardening books, books on alternative energy, books on DIY culture, books on um, experimental city design, urbanism, city gentrification, and experimental design in general regarding urbanism. But my idea within the public realm is that it's a pr propaganda vehicle. One of the things I was interested in doing is take up these past models that had kind of not worked and try and restart them again. So you take, you could, what I would consider taking like 70s hippie ideas and maybe reinventing them in another form. Not necessarily, um, I don't really consider myself a hippie, but um, taking these more radical um, ideas about um, gardening or which all, I mean, a lot of permaculture comes from the 70s. A lot of this experimental gardening does come from the 70s, 60s and 70s taking all these ideas and just restarting them again and seeing maybe why they failed, maybe trying to make them work again. Like, the pro, like things that the provost did, like to maybe taking some of these weird things, but not with this, not f reinventing them, recycling them basically, and seeing if they could work again somehow, but in a, in a modern contemporary form. For example, um, we're taking this model from San Francisco called the Edible Schoolyard. And because our garden is actually in a playground, we're trying to develop the playground so that the playground actually becomes part of the garden. One of the things why we started this was because the kids at the school don't actually, won't believe us that plant vegetables come from the ground. They, won't, they just won't believe us. They just think that we're, we're just lying. And when the children uh, when they go into the garden or when they're brought into the garden, they immediately go back to the concrete because the garden is some very alien place. And so that, um, that kind of relate, their uh, alienation to nature and where their food comes from um, was very important to us, especially in England where um, things like farming have been completely s sort of exploded open and is in total crisis now. This is the back third of the coach, and this part of the coach has been redesigned into a mobile greenhouse as an experiment to see whether plants can survive under mobile conditions. Uh, Biology does seem to be becoming more and more of an interesting topic to me as I develop these projects, because it has so many linking facets, farming and fuel consumption. They're so heavily linked to biology that it's, for me, a very interesting topic to try and um, delve into deeper. And this is our worm bin. This bin um, is a four-layered um, system whereby worms in this layer eat organic... But also, I think it also comes from reading, like, Felix Guattari and his notions of ecology and, and uh, using biology and, and uh, psychoanalysis as well. 
and, and sort of coupling all these things together in a really interesting and complicated way, which I find is um, something that I try and achieve in my own work as by taking all these different facets and somehow sort of try to put them all together, but then creating links to other places by creating this sort of strange hybrid. Um, it's like taking a sort of central computer and adding all these kind of weird peripherals to it and just seeing what's ha what will happen. My proposals, which are also informed by friends, is to create parallel institutions that move along with the regular institutions, but they offer an in a total diversity and uh, alternative to these um, uh, main uh, institutions, and they also have a certain autonomy. And they also, what I believe, has they also have quite a um, radicalizing effect in terms of their politics and their ability to stay autonomous from sort of certain corporate sponsorship or developments. So they almost could be parasites to these institutions, but they're just on that little uh, boundary line between them. And that is something that I've tried to do with the Geocruiser because it's, it has this mobility and it has a certain amount of autonomy and it can exist on a very parasitical level where it gets money from different institutions, but then at the end of the day it can just drive off and, and go elsewhere. We hebben een, een eerste project gedaan, dus in, uh, in een, uh, we hebben gezamenlijk een gordijn ontworpen en daar komen hele grote bloemen in voor. En dat is ons zo goed bevallen dat we in het tweede project, wat feitelijk nu uh, zijn begin heeft, uh, ook bloemen een, uh, een centrale rol spelen. Bloemen zijn hele goede voorbeelden om relaties aan te geven. Dus daarmee is er in beginsel een situatie ontstaan waarbij je een pracht van kleur en vorm en ideeën kunt kijken. Op zo'n manier vormgegeven dat het direct tot de verbeelding spreekt. Bloemen zijn gewoon een heel mooie manier om, om iets aan te bieden, om iets te, uh, te laten zien. En ook om te laten zien hoe dingen met elkaar uh, te maken hebben. Uh, de, de, de knop met uh, de steel, met uh, de bladeren, de manier hoe ze uh, kleur hebben. En ik denk dat uh, bloemen op die manier iets waren waar wij heel veel mee uit konden drukken. Zowel, laten we zeggen, liefde als uh, wat, wat uh, empirisch onderzoek naar uh, relatie. We hebben er in eerste instantie vijf bloemen die we ontworpen hebben. De eerste gaat over oudere mensen en technologie. Waarbij we gekeken hebben hoe in de toekomst technologie het ouder zijn beïnvloedt. Hoe dat aan de ene kant in de domotica zit, in de technologie die in gebouwen plaatsvindt. Aan de andere kant merk je bijvoorbeeld dat, dat oudere uh, een zekere omhelzing hebben voor internettechnologie, allemaal nieuwe uh, dingen. En dat technologie heel erg helpt om langer actief uh, te blijven. 
We kijken naar de, 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 de kunstenaars. In het geval van Willem de Koning is er een tijdje een hele discussie geweest over. Op het moment dat hij zijn schilderijen maakte, die hij meest recentelijk gemaakt heeft, waarbij familieleden ook aangeven dat er sprake is van de dementie. Uh, maar niet meer weet hoe dat nou precies gaat met de waarde van die schilderijen. Uh, zo is er ook een beeldkunstenaar kunstenaar die zijn hele leven geborduurd heeft en nu zo aan het borduren is. Dat hij zijn eigen kokon, zijn eigen huis aan het borduren is. En zo heb je natuurlijk ook muzici, dansers die slechtziend zijn en nog wel op een hele andere manier bewegingen maken. Dat kan ik heel goed in de film zien. De recentere films van John Travolta, die uh, vroeger heel veel, met heel veel capriolen danste en nu eigenlijk danst met een hele kleine beweging. Alleen nog maar knipt en maar de dansen niet minder mooi in wordt. Is het thema wat we in, in, van de relatie tussen kunst en ouderen hebben uitgezocht, is ook de manier hoe bepaalde hoe, hoe zo'n centrum, uh, uh, laten we zeggen, publiek kan blijven en hoe ook kunst een publieke functie kan, uh, kan hebben. Wat voor rol kunst kan spelen in het uh, publieke uh, domein. Want dat is natuurlijk een van de belangrijkste discussies die er uh, is. Nou, dit is een van de bloemen die ingaat op de relatie van senioren tot senioren. Dus uh, op oude dag is er ook nog sprake van liefde, van uh, de jacht, het uh, jagen, het zwemmen. Het dragen van kleding, herinneringen van vroeger en van nu. En dit is een, 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 een tweedimensionale afbeelding van wat we nu op dit moment driedimensionaal aan het onderzoeken zijn. Waarbij die, die tegenstelling hier terug kan vinden door een soort hele bijtende vorm. Die, waarbij je de, de alle mannen ten opzichte van alle vrouwen door elkaar gemengd hebt. Maar dit is nog een, een soort beginfase waarin we eigenlijk nog een hardere, glanzende kanten. We hebben eigenlijk die tegenstelling van hoe die mensen met elkaar omgaan, proberen in een soort sculptuur uh, te krijgen. In het nadenken over uh, visuele strategieën, over uh, tactiele uh, strategieën, is uh, de samenwerking met Beren natuurlijk waanzinnig belangrijk. En, en uh, vinden ook een reflectie in de manier hoe we verder met presentaties omgaan, hoe we detaillering doen, hoe we uh, ook, oh ja, ook wel letterlijk gewoon in het ontwerpwerk zelf. Ja, dat geldt voor mij natuurlijk precies hetzelfde, dat de praktijk... Het, in het beginsel richtte die zich heel erg op, uh, op, op galeries en musea's en, uh, en door heel veel samen te werken is, krijg je ook allerlei andere vragen uh, in, je, in je autonome praktijk. Waarbij ik uh, natuurlijk heel veel gebruik maak van vocabulaire, van de manier van presenteren, van hoe je op, op een gedetailleerde manier met onder andere steden kunt plannen. Architecten geloof. Uh, architectuur uh, omgaat. Uh, ja, ik, ik zal nog niet, het zal me nog, nog niet lukken om zo lang bij zo'n flap te gaan staan om alleen woorden op te schrijven. Maar misschien dat de komende vijf jaar dat me dat gaat lukken. <laughs> Ik denk dat al die middelen die laat zeggen, in de jaren negentig in het bedrijfsleven ontwikkeld zijn, directe interactie, uh, uh, netwerken, niet in hiërarchische schema's uh, uh, denken, uh, je content goed proberen uh, uh, te organiseren, open organisaties, dat, dat die ongelooflijk goed in te zetten zijn om die ambities of, uh, die je hebt, of die, uh, noem het desnoods utopie, om, om die voor elkaar uh, te krijgen. En, uh, bij ons proberen we die, die twee werelden, de ene wereld die laat zeggen, corporate is en de andere wereld die toch gedreven is door uh, wat vroeger uh, utopie heette, wat vroeger avant-garde heette, wat vroeger idealisme uh, heette, uh, op, elkaar, uh, op elkaar aan te sluiten. Dit is het centrum waarin je kan zien hoe uh, heel en ten dagen uh, seniorenarchitectuur overwegend uh, bestaat in Nederland. In hoe ruimtes eruit zien, hoe ze ingevuld worden door uh, het verblijf van die mensen uh, op die plekken. 
Met uh, meubilair, met uh, hobby's en uh, inrichtingen van gangen, keukens, uh, hal, uh, hallen, uh, entreehallen, uh, uh, beginnen van de huisjes, uh, weer een stukken gang. Wat kan je als, als architect en wat voor rol moet je hebben? En wij hebben in onze praktijk uitgevonden dat uh, laat zeggen, de traditionele rol van de architect op basis van uh, een programma dat de andere mensen opgesteld is, de boel mooi maken, uh, uh, dat dat een hele schrale rol is. En die, die, die rol die vertaalt zich dan ook vaak in de architectuurfoto's die dan helemaal uh, uh, leeg zijn. Terwijl wij zeggen van in onze praktijken willen we een veel grotere betrokkenheid met, met de mensen voor wie je bouwt, de hele organisatorisch kader waarin je werkt, de, de verschijning van architectuur in, in de stad en, en de soort levendigheid en sociale aspecten en de uh, interactieve aspecten die, daar, uh, die daarbij horen. Het centrum is feitelijk, hoe zien wij de, de architectuur waar veel senioren mensen in wonen? En die wordt in, in die kern geplaatst omdat je daarmee accent legt op van hoe die situatie op dit moment eruit ziet. Die grote foto eromheen, die laat het eigenlijk zien hoe het in de media, hoe het in alle kunstboeken, hoe het in alle architectuurboeken getoond wordt. En het is in die bloemvorm zo samengevat dat het niet een, uh, elkaar bekritiseert, maar dat je die dingen ten opzichte van elkaar kan zien. Waarbij je door die bloem eigenlijk uh, het niet een soort neg negativiteit, dat je niet die kritiek centraal laat staan, maar dat je het al bijna zeg maar, in een hele mooie vorm die beide problemen laat zien. Dat je het niet problematiseert, maar dat het als beeld helder maakt uit welke, hoe je eigenlijk die twee dingen tegenkomt. En wat je dan zou verwachten als volgende stap. Maar het beeld moet zeg maar, zo goed samengesteld zijn dat het, dat het niet vanuit de kritiek be be besproken wordt. Maar dat het, uh, het beeld een, 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 een ding is wat op zichzelf staat. En dat je die verschillende aspecten daaruit zou kunnen analyseren. Want die mensen die zeg maar, centraal in die bloem staan, die, die leven zeg maar, onder die uh, bijna zo deprimerende omstandigheden. Tenminste, ik vind het niet zo rooskleurig, het gedachtegang dat ik later in zo'n situatie zou moeten leven. Maar ja, op dit moment leven die mensen wel allemaal in zo'n situatie. Je wilt niet die mensen uh, daarmee direct confronteren, omdat je daarmee de, hun huidige situatie uh, alleen maar verergert. Ja, Een van de elementen is die ook in onze praktijk en de samenwerking uh, heel belangrijk is, is dat je probeert dat dingen effect hebben, dat ze de realiteit ingaan. Dat het niet gaat om de diepere verhalen of betekenissen erachter, maar gewoon dat het, dat het op een bepaalde manier actie, actie georiënteerd is. En dat terwijl er natuurlijk een zekere mate van, van reflectiviteit in het werk zit, is het vooral ook de soort directheid en de neiging om dingen meteen te willen maken en operationeel uh, te maken die um, onze samenwerking... Uh, voor mij in ieder geval heel bijzonder maakt. Siri? Ik heb een vriendje hier. Oké. Wauw. Let's see. How does, how does this open? Voor uh, dit denk ik we niet scissors. De basis van een van de bloemen. Uh, de basis van een van de bloemen en technologie. Uh, Zo ook. Een technologie die we hebben in India laten maken omdat het in de techniek moet. Die heel, feitelijk heel arbollig is. En uh, de technologie die voor senior zo moet zijn. Dat verdomme ding is heel mooi geworden. Waanzinnig, <lacht> hè? Prachtig gedaan. Dus dat de, de, de techniek eigenlijk zo'n onderdeel moet zijn van het gewone leven. dat het dezelfde domesticerende werking heeft als zo'n ouderwetse techniek. En hierin worden dus. Uh, allerlei foto's erin in opgenomen die uh, alle alle verschillende aspecten van de technologie en senioren uh, die ze in hun, in hun leven tegenkomen. Maar dat gaat van computers tot en met uh, elektrische stoeltjes en uh, de tandenborstels die elektrisch gaan en, en schermen en, en de medische uh, apparatuur.
whenever we have photographic image, we have the presumption, the sensation of truth, which is not. You know, essentially, who controls the technology decides what the truth is. The Guerre, he made a photograph of an avenue in Paris, and on this avenue, there was only one person standing. But everybody who looked at the picture knew that at that time of day, that avenue was crowded with people. And the reason was the exposure time required that the people stand still, and there was only one person standing still. You have to recognize that the perception is um, conditioned by what the, what the knowing is in relationship to the being. If we can say that per perception is actually the being the moment that you take it in, it's what you know that conditions what you see. It's what you read into this map that makes it interesting or what you read into the painting or to the photograph. What, what you understand about the process of photography will determine whether you can understand the truth that's given by this photograph where this guy is sitting there alone. That is the truth, but it's a truth that has to be understood in relationship to the process of making that image. We start really with the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. when yes. Adlai Stevenson raised satellite images around yeah. at the Security Council and uh, asserts that uh, the United States has proof, proof of so Soviet missile uh, installations. Uh, we continue to have this same standard, you know, which is basically, we have the proof, you can't see it, but you must believe that we have the proof because we're the experts. We got inspired sometime in the 80s uh, by, uh, by uh, satellite, uh, earth, earth monitoring satellites. Uh, 79. 79, okay, to uh, look at uh, hot spots on the globe and uh, analyze what was really happening. I have this catalog of, from NASA from 77 of Landsat data where you can call up and you just, uh, you just order by the coordinates of the latitude and longitude and you can order any image of any place on Earth. So, you, you know, people would call up and order their hometown or whatever. Yeah, yeah. This is a... Um four-band composite of the San Francisco Bay Area from a Landsat scene. It's a one-to-one -one composite. If you look at the area right along here, there are some um, refineries and holding tanks up in that area, uh, petrochemicals and runoff and asphalt. Who had the idea of having the continuous TV network where you could see all over the Earth from satellites at all times? That was your idea. Now, that was like this brilliant, <laughs> really brilliant idea that the satellites could be used for peace by by broadcasting all, you know, every bit of the earth could be visible on TV channels to everybody in the world, so everybody would know what was going on. There is a, literally, a, a, a waterfall of data coming down from outer space. It's constantly just coming in, and so little of it gets to the world. And if we could just find a way, I don't know how amongst us or some other people, to get this thing out, out so people can actually see desertification, see, uh, uh, various forms of uh, ecological damage. See whatever is going on, uh, sprawl, um, and it's just, it's, I must say, been, we have not succeeded at, at all, uh, or at least not substantially. Now you're talking about the OECD has not succeeded Yeah, we, we, it, we as people with, I think all of us, I think none of us have succeeded, have succeeded in realizing our dream of this idea. We had, we had hoped and expected that it would be widely available and freely available, and in fact, they claim now that it is available, but, in, but the, they have privatized it and they have placed it out of reach of almost all <clears throat> of the public, but only those with the uh, financial means now have access to it, yes. and that really restricts it to a very small group. It's definitely the time when we should, more than any other time, 
actually raise these questions. And I think that the, the question, that, the point that George is making is really important, and that is, who, if nobody's allowed access to this data and nobody fights for the freedom to look at this data, then any picture can be labeled anything and be used by the government or anybody else to prove their point. The more people that know and understand the nature of satellite data and how it's, how it's read, okay. the better chance we have to prevent things like this from determining policy, which we don't want. I think the Chernobyl story is it, it's where that actually functioned beautifully. What was going on was that um, various government uh, officials are getting, I think, hip to what we were doing with mass media and getting worried about this. And so we knew it was more and more getting to be a race. Could we get the material first? And it worked out that people here in New York uh, were able to get the data in Washington. But for a reason which I have yet to find out, uh, we had to have uh, apparently uh, German scientific advisors there in the room working with the data. See, that is, uh, now some people are saying that's reactor number one, or number four, and others are saying four is only the other. What then happened is the data was supposed to be sent immediately over to Munich to be processed by Dr. Haydn, who was a very good scientist in Munich at his own company, and John had already had experience with him, and, and uh, well, basically it just wasn't coming, and wasn't coming, and wasn't coming, and all the media deadlines were not being met and it was staying in Washington being disinformed. When we finally, what happened as a result of that is all the official information was that there was a, a cloud of smoke. Mm -hmm. And there was only one reactor. So. Wait, 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 wait. This, is, this is the natural color. And this is the smoke, like smoke and shadow. And the reason why that's that is a second what reactor is that, What is it that rich uh, of the smoke? What is it? Is that southwest? Is this That would be southwest. Oh, that's... Well, that's, you when was this picture taken? 9.30 to 10 o'clock? You already had one tape, so you, so you saw, so on that one tape you could see this, this black line. And so in order to prove that it wasn't smoke, we needed another tape from the second pass two weeks later. If that was still there, it would, it would, uh, it would prove uh, Peter's theory. So um, I was living in Hamburg at the time, and I hadn't spoken to Peter in probably three years, and he phoned me up and said, will you fly up to Sweden and get it? So I went up there and picked up a tape from this body image, brought it down to Munich, and met him there. And we went and processed it, and the, the streak was still there. So Peter's theory about the ground swells, you know, we had the ability to prove it. I would have to say that the main virtue you need in the satellite business is honesty um, and is persistence. Because there are everywhere you go attempts to deflect people from the truth for all kinds of reasons. Even in your own country this would happen where we had uh, found out the, this algae bloom with very low resolution data mm -hmm. in the North Sea. But because there's this very great fear of not letting the public think that there might be a toxic algae bloom, you had an official from, your, from the NOEZ uh, as some oceanographic institute getting up there and saying there's no problem, it's not really happening, or whatever. And so our main object problem is really in, but not one of high quality interpretation, just simply getting any interpretation that seems plausible through at all. Mm -hmm. Or in fact allowing a variety of interpretations to be publicly debated. I've just completed a, a, a small analysis of one of the most recent instances of that. Uh, which uh, appeared in many uh, newspapers uh, in the U.S., probably in Europe as well, uh, where the CIA released an image of mass possible, quote, possible mass graves in Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. This led a young reporter, William Rode, to go there. He then reported in the Christian Science Monitor that indeed there was evidence of mass graves at this location. However, his description, which was published, uh, in the Christian Science Monitor, described this as larger than a football field. The other day, I counted the pixels in the area labeled, the larger of the two areas labeled possible mass graves. It would take 40 such areas to make one football field. And so nobody ever got the opportunity to discuss whether, in fact, there was validity to this image. And yet, policy was made on the basis of the public's 
yes. assumption that yes, we're being told by experts that this is mm -hmm. the interpretation. And I think all of us are trying in some sense to respond to what's going on around us uh, because we sort of have to, because when you think George Bush well, is not going to. We're talking about a very uh, esoteric area of, uh, of, but it, of, of, of freedom, yes. freedom of information at a time when freedom of information on all levels is, is, is shrinking for, for everyone. We can zoom in on that in this Landsat satellite picture. See some um, interesting features. If we look at... George, what was your objection to our doing the project on the Falkland Islands? Uh, my objection is that I did not wish to be a partisan. Uh, and uh, partisan. a partisan uh, in that uh, it appeared to me, and indeed I think events bore this out, that uh, uh, with the, the BBC as a client, you would not have the uh, ability to, in fact, make public the information you would in, uh, obtain. Uh, that the BBC would take what you did and cast a particular uh, interpretation on it, and that that is what would be fed to the rest of the world. And this is Pebble Island, the Argentinian air base attacked by British commanders last Friday night. When George talks about the TV contract being somehow with a client that might be misusing material, that was almost always the case. Uh, uh, taking a satellite investigation on, say, two or three video cassettes to a TV company was like taking a heifer prize steer to McDonald's. It was going to be turned into the worst hamburger meat possible. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us distanced ourselves in the Memphis Falkland Islands thing. I just want to state that for the record. A lot of us took a big step backwards from the ocean earth at that point. The idea was that we get, get the data. And then show what? There, and then we, we give it away. We use yeah. it. Everybody uses it. Wow. Right? We all agree with that. So how do you propose to do that now? We have a chance? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Get us the data. What is... Uh, consistent throughout our history is the uh, presumption that artists and scientists working together can uh, offer alternatives and that sometimes we choose specifics to basically demonstrate that, you know, a sort of demonstration project. But it could very well be that uh, two years from now, our focus in some way has changed on the assumption that we have made our point about that. I think in some ways, we have made our point about the observation of the Earth. And I would say that the fact that we have put the idea out there and that it has become part of, of the general discourse is, is, I think, one of the things that, that uh, we have we and people like us have contributed. I, I second that because uh, we, working with Peter, I realized that in fact that's not a new idea at all. It happened in the Renaissance, it happened at different times in history, and we're just in a way trying to bring it back. Okay, how about the area between the airport and the Israeli positions? Is there anything else going on that we can, with this kind of resolution that we can find? Maybe going now to the right, the east. Are there any telltale clues? Shall we paint it to the other color to see if we can find any?
The story of Detroit is not very well known. It's kind of exists as a, some kind of a mythical uh, space, surrounded with music, the Motown to house music now, the mythology of the automobile industry, the mythology of that it being the murder city at one point from being a motor city. Uh, it's a dark, dangerous space that uh, is uh, scary. At the same time, it has a kind of adventure, you know, factor, you know, fear factor, if you will, like a television show, you know? But as you drive, as you walk, and you see these buildings that are burnt and empty, uh, it starts to talk to you and say, you know, look, you're an architect. Can you do something about me? <laughs> I'm here and I want to be functional again. And uh, what's your idea? It, it starts to, to really speak to you in, in a way that, that, uh, that you could only think about the possibilities. I look at Detroit as possibly the last real city in the world. Uh, we see uh, disnifications uh, that are occurring in uh, the, the, uh, gen the generic cities of the developing countries. Uh, the franchise stores and economies have moved in, uh, taking over small urban spaces and shops that used to predominate the city. It's all about particular image building. It's a set of illusions that are being constructed through architecture in many ways, right? So architecture is becoming much, much more as a media industry as opposed to a spatial functional industry than ever before, right? Now in Detroit, none of those things exist. And what you see is only the reality of a history of what happened in the last 50 years and even before, of course, about the city. Suddenly, you look at architecture very differently, you know. Uh, they're no longer just an entity of functions and commercial values. It became, for me, the most fascinating and central place to reconsider the whole urban theory. And that, I assume, would not come from the architects themselves, the, the industry of architecture, but it has to come from outside. None of these ideas about the future of the area are any ideas of my own. They're all comprised of fragments and stories and ideas from the people that who lives there, who have been living there for a long time. My tactic uh, was very much the uh, kind of ghetto style, if you will, which is to walk around the street and meet some strangers and start you know, talking with them, uh, getting to know them, uh, begin to make friends and listen to their stories. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that what I realized that is something about the story of Detroit that they tell you is real stories, that it is not something that they have imagined, but it's something yes. they have seen. And these stories have, in order, have, have in, at the end contributed to the way that I describe about my projects now which is very narrative story oriented. And the House uh, 24260 project came as a kind of a result of the abundancy of empty spaces and empty houses in Detroit. And imagining how that art architecture could be an instrument of change, you know, as opposed to design. But realizing that this process is a kind of a process that takes many years to achieve that I need to first to show a story of Detroit in a very condensed, concentrated form. And so I wanted to take Detroit out 
to the world. Uh, the basic problem of the city, uh, I think to me, is not about the whole city, but about individual people, their individual spaces, uh, their livelihood, uh, their cultural sub uh, existence, and uh, that, that how that we should start thinking small in order to think, imagine big. By the way, this building, the door was intact on this building just a year ago, because I know we filmed here. Oh, 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 around there, I mean, there were houses all up and down the, these streets, because mainly there were Chrysler workers living here. And, you know, if you threw a stone up in the air, you probably hit a Chrysler worker. There were, there were so many of them living there. The plant at that time employed about 17,000 workers. And steadily, it declined until it was employing maybe 2,000 workers. And now it's been almost completely automated. Uh, so as the work, as the plant slows down, the people began leaving. People left this east side of town to go over the west side, because in 1957, what happened, as the freeways were developed, the opportunity for whites, particularly, to move out of town to the suburbs increased. And the uh, apartment houses and the houses on the west side, which had been occupied by whites, were now open and people moved from the east side to the west side. So the depopulation took place for two reasons. One, because of the, the uh, uh, reduction of workers at the plant. And two, because people were moving over to the west side and to, to take place, replace the people who moved to the suburbs. So now what you see is empty lots. Uh, her name is uh, Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, she's uh, 87 years old, Chinese American. One of the, the most important political activists in Detroit. Uh, been there since 1950s, early 50s. She was a part of the African-American civil rights movement. Uh, she was married to an African-American factory worker who had the tremendous gift of uh, understanding their conditions and uh, ability to speak in such a manner that he had a tremendous charismatic power over the general people in the community. So she worked together with him until his death, I believe, about seven years ago. And she is one of the many people, uh, but she is one of the key people that I have uh, worked with. And she has been tremendous uh, in especially uh, promoting and introducing uh, another project uh, called Adama, which is uh, subtitled as a new equity for Detroit. Uh, it's an idea of developing the future for the Near East side of uh, Detroit, where I uh, lived in the past three years. It's about two and a half square miles of very well-defined uh, general landscape of a consistent destruction and absence of urban uh, public life. We made some preliminary plans for year 2010 uh, using urban agriculture as a metaphor and the process to reconstitute, first of all, the land and the physical uh, built environment uh, and the way of uh, uh, teaching and employing uh, people to reconstruct themselves from the resources that exist there. Uh, we're at the corner of uh, Moran and Farnsworth, uh, a neighborhood which was a relatively intact neighborhood and remains so to an extraordinary extent to this day, mainly because of the activities of Paul Wirtz, who is a science teacher at the Catherine Ferguson Academy and who has uh, taken over a number of the houses and renovated them so that people have come to live here to be part of an urban collaborative. This is the area behind the houses, and all of these were tore down one at a time. So if you can kind of see the, the houses, they were all, you know, 40-foot lots, a house on every lot. And over time, they became, you know, abandoned and uh, 
neglected and burnt down. And a lot of it was, a lot of Detroit, you hear about uh, the Devil's Night fires that, w that made the news throughout the country and world. And a lot of it was these houses were insurance deals that um, it really became uneconomical for people if you're a landlord to just make money without investing. So the quickest way to make money off your, your uh, property for the short run is to do an insurance claim, you have a kid burn it off, and then you can collect more money than you could get by trying to sell a house in a bad neighborhood. This, was, this kind of building was on every corner and every block, and this was a grocery store, and that was a, a, a drug store, hardware store, and over the other corner was a, a bar, <laughs> and the other corner was, you know, a restaurant or a meat shop. City, and I think there's like 40,000 vacant lots in the city of Detroit, which is like 10,000 acres. This, this lot, this has got the alfalfa in it, I planted. And this, this lot right here, this little lot here, I get about 15 bales every cutting out. So 15 times three is $45. We do not need now, anything from outside. It, I just the resources oh, needed to reconstruct this, this area already exist. Out. And that start out with the land as the most valuable commodity. First, we begin to clean the toxic condition of the landscape. Uh, the second is that to begin to produce food in the area to feed the population, which some people already started to do in, in, in this area. I'm Maxine Turk Elam. My maiden name is Turk. And I'm from Alabama originally. I was born there. Everything we you use, we plant it. But I've been growing vegetables all my life ever since I can remember, even when I was small. Then my grandmother would take us through the woods. She was part Indian. And we would pull leaves for medication. And we would make teas out of grasses, uh, horse mint, uh, sassafras, and different leaves was used for different just, purposes. Just take a whiff. It's My purpose really is to, uh, is to promote imaginations and possibilities. And because they are uh, uh, subconsciously originated from the people themselves, it sits rather comfortably for them to understand or even accept and even pursue their realization. So it is uh, more of the work of uh, visualizing those ideas that already existed uh, within the people that, who lived there which a lot of these people don't perceive them as an idea or information. They just see it as an experience. I put them together in some fashion to coordinate into a uh, strategy or a structure. You have to realize that the American government has supposedly have spent about $2 trillion to try to save the inner cities in the last 50 years. And since everything that so far have came up has failed, what needs to be done is something radically different, uh, a, a kind of utopic scale. What required is a vision, not money. The community is expecting something radical because they've seen everything else. You know, they don't want to see another projects coming from outside that they, they know from right away, not even looking at it, that they feel is going to fail. So I think that connection to the radical visions and utopia is already present there. And in fact, one of the economic strategies of this fictional utopia of Arama is that the land would be entirely owned by the community. There would be no private ownership. I'm sorry, it some, some, sounds somewhat similar to communist you know, view. But we do, it's not, it's more native uh, American view because we're willing to let other people to come into the community 
uh, however, we would not sell the land to them. We would offer the land as a service that they are allowed to come into this community if they use the land in a productive manner. There's no ownership. It's all based on productive values. Right? They pay us rent for the productive value of the property, and that funds what goes back into the community reinvestment. Right? So uh, the, the ownership is, again, based on the value of the production as opposed to a physical ownership of the land because physical ownership does not do anything with the production. These land has been set up empty, doing nothing for years and years. For our interest is not just own this land, but to turn it into a productive uh, land. We live here, this is our land, and we're gonna take this control, right? So it's like back into the, the wild, wild west, right? Who claims this land? You know, it's like almost like a Native uh, American uh, story, right? It goes back to the beginning of the founding of Detroit. We're back in the same game. And now it is, I mean, Native Americans, the, the, the inner city people are becoming the Native Americans.